Ethan, you are welcome to take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you everybody for coming in and I, I see more people are joining, but uh, we're going to get started. Um, uh, my name is Keith Hammond. I'm an editor at Make Magazine, have been for a long time. Um, and uh, Make Magazine, as you know, brings it brings you Maker Fair every year. And this, this year we can't do a live one in the Bay Area, but we're doing a virtual one around the world uh, as a replacement. It's been going pretty well, um, despite a very short ramp up. And uh, we had a, just amazing amazing buy-in from the whole maker community. It's been great. Um, I wanted to introduce the, uh, the team from Open Source Medical Supplies. Joining us today, we have uh, Angela Forges and Victoria Jacqua. You can raise, wave your hands so people can see who you are. There you go. Um, they are the medical co-leads for the team that has put together the Open Source uh, COVID Medical Supply Guide, which a lot of us makers out in the world have been relying on to find um, designs that we can trust and that, and that we know that doctors and, and medical um, professionals will accept or are accepting around the world as useful in their in their work. Uh, we have Christina Cole who leads the documentation for the team and she has a medical legal background. Um, and then Ash Hennigan is leading research for this medical team. There's Ash. And um, we are just going to try and figure out how they have turned a, a Facebook group of 70,000 plus people all with their own ideas into some sane, rational recommendations for what kind of, what kind of, uh, of replicable designs are out there for makers to make. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, at Maker Fair today. Um, and before we start, I just want to give a little background for those who are, have not followed the story of open source medical supplies. Um, two and a half months ago, uh, when the lockdowns began and, and the, and the, you know, the, the sort of coronavirus panic started to ramp up. We realized we're going to be short on PPE and we saw makers starting to make their own, um, which on the one hand was a great thing, very exciting. We're proving that distributed manufacturing works and that the maker movement is everywhere and we can, we can use these new tools to, to help. But at the same time, we were, we were seeing hundreds of new designs for face shields or ventilators. I mean, things, how do we know if any of these things are, are safe or if they'll even work? Um, you know, we make magazine was starting to publish the stories of some of the makers who were innovating these things. We were starting to recommend how to instructions for making some of them, but it was really hard to, to figure out like, is this really legit? It looks legit, but it's kind of the wild west out here. We are not scientists. We're not medical people. How do we really know uh, if we're recommending something good or something that might be sketchy? And there were a few designs that were clearly accepted by hospitals or HMOs, but a lot of designs that were coming out of the maker community that we just had no idea. And, and that's when we found open source medical supplies. Uh, they had started a Facebook group, I believe on March 10th. Uh, and within a few weeks, there were 70,000 members. They had issued guides on how to organize uh, to get makers connected with medical professionals. But uh, more importantly, from our side, organizing the, the medical supplies guide, which had um, you know, proven designs that had been accepted by medical uh, personnel, then that this team was researching and, and curating into a collection that makers could begin making at home. Um, so those are two huge jobs. The organizing piece of, of open source medical supplies has, is being covered in, in some, other, uh, some other presentations here at Maker Fair. This one will focus on how did you find medically sound designs that we can actually make and that we, we, we can show to our local hospitals and clinicians and that, they, that they'll um, be able to, to accept for use. So I think the best way to start maybe is to let the four of you just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit how, about yourselves and how you got involved and, and uh, where, how you came to it. What were, you, what were you doing before coronavirus? Sure, thank you, Keith. Um, my name is Christina and prior to joining OSMS, I was working in the medical documentation sector as a medical transcriptionist and an electronic health records editor. Um, as Keith mentioned, I do come from a medical legal background. And it was pretty early, uh, actually mid-March. And uh, as if any of you attended Guy's talk earlier, there was this Facebook group that was started and grew quite quickly. And early on, I was tagged in a post, which was a call for documentation, uh, engineers, medical background, everything. Everyone we have today, I think uh, probably 
saw that post and I said, okay, I don't know what I'm getting into here, but I jumped on it and it's been a wild 10 weeks or so. <laughs> that feels like 10 years, um, but I'm very happy to be here. How about uh, Victoria? I'm a registered radiology technologist with a background in cardiac procedures. So that's my uh, day job. Um, I also have a background in art and design, fabric technology, and primitive technology as well. So I understand the process of making and how long it takes to get from an idea to a finished product. Great. Angela, how about you? Uh, yeah, so I am an epidemiologist by training, um, and my day job is a healthcare and life science um, strategy expert, um, but really the expertise I've been le leveraging with OSMS is the epidemiological background, um, and for those, I think everyone at this point is familiar with that term, um, but epidemiology, just to be clear, is the study of the determinants and distribution of disease, and so, you know, it's the, it's the group of folks who are tracking um, COVID behind the background, in, or rather in the background. Um, I came to OSMS similar to um, Christina through the Facebook group. Um, I saw uh, Guy make a call uh, for folks with some sort of um, medical or clinical background and hopped on um, at that point. That's great. Ash, how about you? I'm a math and science teacher, as well as a robotics coach, <clears throat> and I got started with the movement in general um, when I found out my mother-in-law, who's a clinician, was working at a testing site, and this was very early, day one, the testing site opens. She was complaining about not having gown, not having a face shield, not having a respirator. She was testing possible COVID patients with absolutely no protective gear, and then I started looking for solutions and um, the Facebook group was there. Um, we have a local um, uh, maker site here, uh, the Future Forge. And so I connected with the Facebook group. I connected with um, some local makers and I got involved initially just to kind of take care of a family member. And then um, we started thinking about uh, helping more people I reached out to OSMS to get some help um, with that process, and uh, they were great about helping get the information to us that we needed. I ended up sharing some research that we had done and some of the documentation that we had, and um, that proved useful. So then it turned into um, you know, a more official relationship where I started helping uh, contribute research to other documents as well got more and more involved over time. That's great. Um, I want to hear more about uh, the research side of it a little later, but I, I wanted to let Christina kind of give us the overview of the guide itself. Uh, what is it? How do you curate that? Um, what, what do you hope that it does for the maker community? Um, I don't know if people are, maybe if somebody can screen share and kind of show an example, I'll try. Um, but um, I'd be, I'd be happy to give you kind of an uh, overview of it. So our medical supply guide actually started as an engineering requirements document originally and specifically for ventilators. Um, this was something that Guy also mentioned in his, his talk early today. Its goal was to state the problem to be solved and also to explicitly outline all of the standards, engineering requirements, fabrication requirements, etc., that ventilators were subject to. But Guy is our founder of OSMS, for those that either weren't on that talk or don't have a lot of background info. Uh, he quickly realized the need to focus on much more than just ventilators, and it became a requirements document for most supplies and devices required in the management of COVID-19 patients. Um, this required an understanding of what COVID-19 was, how it was treated, what medical supplies were used to treat it, and also the standards to which were applied to each of these supplies. And at this point, a sizable team began to form around building this document. And this was back in the, the earliest days of OSMS. We started with the basic structure that still exists in the supply guide today. And then again, that's the what is COVID-19? What items are used in the management of a COVID-19 patient? 
how can people make these items and connect healthcare workers with supplies? And from there, working groups seem to just kind of form organically. We had engineers who were busy making charts and deliberating fabrication requirements, specifications. Um, our medical professionals were sifting through many, many designs that were pouring into the Facebook group with the help of our moderators. And then documentation team were writing pages and pages of information on each of these items, each design. And although the size of these groups has reduced, the amount of information coming into us continued to grow. And the team that currently exists today started to develop a workflow around this process. Um, we're constantly updating the docs we have just because the situation around COVID-19 changes so frequently. Um, a little bit on how it works. Med team tracks the designs produced from within the maker communities and they gather the feedback provided by hospitals, organizations and clinicians that use them. Our doc team incorporates these designs into the doc that corresponds with the type of supplier device it is. And then there's research and updates on information pertaining to not just the global supply chain shortages or relevant news, um, but also COVID-19 itself. And this requires reading dozens of medical papers to incorporate this information as a current representation of COVID-19. And then Tech Doc, while this is going on, pulls specs in from designs so that makers can quickly assess what is needed to make a very specific item. And all of these efforts combined are what produces the supply category pages that are listed within our medical supply guide. Um, we are continually debating ways to refine our processes and also the ways in which we organize and present this information because ultimately we want to be able to best serve the makers striving to alleviate the supply chain shortages of medical supplies and devices. Well, you're, well, you're definitely doing that. That's got to be a huge ongoing research project to, to, I mean, keep it up to date for what's known about COVID and CDC recommendations are changing and supply chains are, are, are shutting down or starting up again. I mean, it's a uh, lot to stay on top of yeah, for sure. I mean, and, it's, and it's obviously, you know, it's, it's continued, it just continues to grow. You have, you have um, medical gear in all these categories, face shields, obviously, um, uh, people are making very successfully because it's something that can be done with with even hand tools, but really easily done and, and quantities uh, on laser cutters and other other tools at maker spaces. That's been an easy one for people to take it and run with it. But there's also, I mean, there's the list. I, I just uh, I lost my window, but the, the list of different medical supplies that people are, are in need of is really long and it keeps growing. It does. And as of this past week, we hit 91 links to designs that we have published, but behind the scenes, we've actually passed 100. Okay, so that's 100 different designs you've had to, you've had to run down. And, and um, maybe, I don't know who, who uh, can talk a little bit more about how do you, how do you verify what's, what's being used in hospitals and, and you know, are, are, are doctors requesting changes to those designs and how, how does that get fed back to the community? Or, or I mean, we, we've seen um, even even the really most popular designs like the Budman face shield was one of the first ones that really was widely adopted and the Wisconsin face shield. Those things were really quickly adapted for different manufacturing techniques or because doctors said it doesn't fit right or it doesn't cover right or, or this, we can't use those kind of straps. I mean, there's there, there's a constant churn in the designs themselves as, as they're adopted by different medical professionals and, and you know, manufactured by different teams with different machines. How do you guys, you know, stay on top of, or are you, are you helping guide that process or are you just tracking it to, so that it's well understood? Uh, I would say maybe a little bit of both. You know, as Christina said, we mine Slack, um, Facebook, um, and many, many, many working groups. Um, and that may be other Facebook groups um, larger hospital groups that we're a part of, um, local response groups that are um, co-branded with us, and even groups that are not co-branded with us, um, and other, um, and the clinicians specifically, um, you know, and their groups as well. Um, in, in essence, we work 
collaborative we work with we work collaboratively collaboratively um, with the both the clinical and the maker communities um, effectively we act as a bridge um, and then we try to elevate the designs um, that have already received some clinical feedback um, and then we clearly document that um, and confirm um, if a design has been reviewed by a governmental body you know of course we're tracking that and including that and you know marking that as necessary um, but then you know there are a lot of designs that are also just in progress, right? Through these working groups um, that we track. Um, and I can share two examples of, um, you know, recent groups that we've connected with. Um, one is um, Connor Weller out uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, he's working on a mask and collaborating, uh, collaborating deeply um, with clinicians for his initial round of testing. Um, and we've had a chance to talk with those clinicians um, and Connor as well. Um, there's also Cosmic Medical, um, who's in uh, British Columbia. Uh, uh, and they are working on something called a non-invasive um, ventilation helmet. And we've actually been invited to join their design meetings. Um, and so there's sort of a lot of work and research that goes on in the background. Um, and actually, my colleagues Ash and Victoria uh, can speak more to those collaborative relationships that we've established and all the deep, deep research uh, that goes on behind the scenes, um, as well as the other sort of more broad relationships um, and connections that we've been able to facilitate. Victoria, what about that? I mean, um, you know, in progress designs. You're, you're, you, I think you're doing more than just being the matchmaker between the inventor and the, and the clinician. You're, you're kind of helping that process move forward, right? Yes, I think one of the things you have to remember is this uh, pandemic has caused a lot of motivation for people to help. And OSMS has provided a platform, an international platform for people to pool their skills and their conversations to help in any way that they can. So the medical team is very closely connected to our Facebook community and the groups and the um, social media groups that form from that. We look at pretty much all design related posts that come through Facebook. We really do. We look at them closely. Um, we uh, develop conversations from there. Um, sometimes there will be a clinician that uh, has a call for help in some way. He's like, I need this part. How can someone help me make it? That um, happened with a clinician in Mount Sinai who was looking for a fabrication help for a PEEP valve a resistor cap that he had developed for a BiPAP ventilator modification circuit. And we were able to collaborate with him, help him get his part made. And um, he is working with us on other research that we're doing. Um, sometimes the uh, process is simply to facilitate a conversation between a designer and a clinician. For instance, we had a second year resident in Algiers reach out to us. He needed help developing a modification from an oxygen mask into a CPAP mask, which requires a tripod strap um, over the mask to be fabricated. I put him in touch with an OSMS volunteer. Within 72 hours, a CAD model and an STL file had been produced, and the device is now in clinical testing. So we, we try to identify needs and resources really quickly and follow a conversation um, to help uh, get the design to an end state that's usable. And Sometimes these conversations, especially in the early days, were going on all at the same time, um, especially internationally. Um, so within a week, there were some people that had face shields in their hospitals in Europe, and they kept posting their updates. Okay, I've gotten this far with the design. Then three days later, they would come back. Here's my documentation for the design. Here's what, here it is in the hospital. So our job was to collect those conversations and hand them over to Christina, who would then put them into the document. Um, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. We, we, early on, we 
decided to start compiling the designs we found that we thought were legit. And we make sort of a big list, like, look, ventilators are a moonshot. That's gonna take months. Vaccines are gonna take years. Everybody wants to do something to help out right now. What can you do right now? You can sew masks. We have good mask designs. Let's get going on that right now. We have good face shields. There's already five or six of them. Let's start, ma let's start making those. And that list has grown and grown, and we call it the big list of COVID projects that makers can make right now. You can find it on the, the Make Magazine website. And I'm constantly updating that because it's changing. You know, the ground is just shifting constantly um, in, in this space. But um, I've had to make decisions just based on, you know, what are we seeing people ask for the most? You know, what are, what are we, um, you know, obviously, Masks, shields, and gowns, I think, is kind of growing now as, as a recognized shortfall uh, in medical supply. Um, but you guys, are, you guys are seeing it at such a, such a more granular level than that. I mean, how much time can you spend on one valve for one or, or one splitter for one particular hospital? Is that, is that machine in every single hospital? Does it make sense to spend your time on that? Or, or do you have to do triage? You're seeing so many requests and so many ideas. How, how do you triage and, and pick the ones you think you, you can make the most difference. Uh, Keith, I'll speak to this a little bit. This again is a, a thing that comes from that bridge that med team has formed with the community. There's a tremendous amount of behind the scenes outreach that goes on because the items that you're mentioning, the need for those is going to be so tremendously varied, not just country to country, but city to city, region to region, it is, you know, all over the place. So that's where a lot of the really paying close attention to the kind of conversations that are happening, uh, what like almost stories we are hearing from people in these groups saying, I work at a hospital, I don't have any of this, or, you know, we're almost out of, out of that. And Gowns was a good example that we had recently, but the, the items that are most in need changes quite frequently. Um, you know, early on, like you mentioned, there was just a, an explosion in face shields and masks. And one way that we kind of keep track of what's um, trending, so to speak, is we keep an eye on our numbers, on our documents. So it has been very interesting to see them shift throughout the course of this disease so far. Uh, where we have gone for initially a large number of people looking at the mask designs, looking at the facial designs. Now we're seeing more people paying attention to more complex items, the papper hoods, this new category that that med team has really been working on and seen come up of aerosol boxes, um, which was an item that didn't existed in concept and maybe in very small numbers before this pandemic. But this is a, an entirely new um, piece of medical equipment that that did not exist before, so it's been it's been a challenge to keep up with that. And we have a few different ways that we kind of have to collaborate to to kind of create almost a forecast, if you will, of where we're going to be turning our attention next. Um, we have uh, maybe five or six minutes. Are we are we a half hour? I think we're a half hour. Uh, you are welcome to go beyond that. We don't have to stick with the half okay, hour. I think we can go a little long, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rush people. But um, I, um, I I had some questions. I, I showed you guys these yesterday, but um, and and you know maybe uh, Victoria, you may be the, the best interface here between the the you know medical design and the maker tech sort of um, interface, but. I mean, how has the maker community informed what, what you're doing? I, I'm sure that there's a lot you didn't know uh, three months ago about, you know, laser cutting PETG or, or whatever, whatever it's going to be, or welding Tyvek or whatever, whatever you've had to learn uh, um, from, uh, from the makers that you're connecting with. How has the maker community informed you? Well, in terms of the research for standards and fabrication, um, Ash is the one that can speak about that um, more succinctly. But um, I think as a team, we try to make sure that there is a variety of designs in the guide so that people have an opportunity to make depending on the material that is available to them. 
not everybody has a 3D printer, not everybody has a laser cutter, not everyone has an injection molder, but we have a really um, wide variety of designs. So um, there's opportunity for everyone. And we especially try to keep our international community in mind. Um, we have a few facial designs that are crisis level. Um, we have a uh, mask in our face mask. A document that is a no so face mask that comes in the Navajo language because there's a great need in the Navajo Nation right now. And part of uh, paying attention to the face group, do we not only see uh, designs that are bubbling up, but we also see uh, areas of need that are really specific. And one of the things that have come up is tribal need. Um, we've been supporting a group called Protect Native Elders that really focuses on getting supplies to the tribal communities on a national basis, not just Navajo. Um, in terms of fabrication, um, I, I couldn't say that I am an expert in 3D printing or laser cutting or anything. I have a basic understanding how those things work. And I know that the more simply a design is made, uh, sometimes it's easier to make, but sometimes a facility wants a design a certain way. So it's more about um, collecting a variety that we know facilities like, and we put it out to the community and then the facilities in the community can select what, what they can contribute. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, getting something from an idea to 3D printing, I do understand the CAD modeling and the STL requirements, different filaments, and um, some filaments can be sterilized, some can't. So. I try to involve that in my conversation if I'm talking with a designer. One thing that I learned that I had no idea, and this was thanks to Victoria, Ash, and Angie's incredible work on our gowns document and the calls and the outreach that they did uh, when, when people were coming in with designs and considering alternative materials, I was hearing a lot of talk about cow carpet being used, um, which is just a, I have an agriculture background. I have a lot of homesteading experience. Um, so the thought of this material that I have handled before in, in landscaping and in, in livestock uh, being used for a gown had never crossed my mind. So that, that was an example where it's, it's polypropylene, sure, like some, if that's all you have, that might be what gets used in your gown design. So to your question, that was one that I was um, fairly kind of, it made me think differently about uh, certain materials. We saw, we saw masks being made out of grocery bags. One of the first surgical style masks was made with non-woven polypro made from your, you know, recycled grocery bags. And then uh, somebody else came out and said, well, my car covers, we're making car covers out of the exact same non-woven polypro and you can make a, like a 150 masks from one car cover. So here's how we're doing that. I mean, the, the materials out there and, and you know, the, the factories can't keep up with the demand right now. So you, people are sourcing those same materials from some unexpected places, but. There's been a lot of innovation for sure. Well, Ash, what do you Talking about that, that innovation, that really ties into what I've learned the most from the maker community and from this whole movement. Um, in a world with open source information, and open source designs and motivated people. Um, we live in a, a world of solutions more than a world of problems. And the more that I see on the Facebook page, the more that I talk to clinicians, uh, I just keep realizing over and over again that the solutions are there and they might not be great solutions. Like making a gown out of landscape fabric <laughs> is not a great solution, but we don't always get great solutions and we have to be open to the realistic needs that are there and the opportunities that people have to make things better and this is not a situation where things are going to be perfect but if you think about a year ago if anybody had talked about making medical gowns out of landscape fabric I mean, you couldn't have get you couldn't get a person to listen to that conversation. You couldn't get industry experts to talk about it. You couldn't get hospitals to even answer an email because it would just be so crazy. But with all this information sharing, clinicians 
sharing what their needs are and how people can help and the people that want to help, whether they're an industry expert that's reaching, reaching out to maker groups to provide information, or if it's maker groups saying, this is the equipment that we have and this is the kind of thing we can do with equipment. We're seeing all of this come together in a way that um, I certainly didn't realize was possible before this happened. Medical equipment and protective gear, it was so highly specialized, so highly regulated. It would have seemed impossible for something like this to happen a year ago, but here we are in the midst of an open source movement and a maker movement that is really stepping up and doing something amazing. Well, and that was one of my next questions is, I mean, this, um, you know, in some cases, um, companies have released their designs permanently for the crisis and said, you know, we'll, we'll suspend our, our IP for now. Go ahead and go ahead and make our, make the Medtronic ventilator if you can. Um, and uh, we, ended, we ended up having to help organize makers to update some of the schematics from those were quite old designs that weren't, weren't were released in a, in, a, in a form that wasn't very usable. So the maker community kind of helped um, update those uh, schematics. But, you know, the vast majority of what we're seeing is not controlled by anybody's IP. These are designs people are coming up with on their own. They're releasing them freely for the whole world to make and, and, to, and to iterate and improve. And I mean, I'm, from my point of view, this, this None of this would be possible without that spirit of open source sharing, but also the tools that people use for open source sharing. I mean, you've got people collaborating on GitHub on, on you know, 50% of the projects we see are, are documented on, on GitHub or some other public sharing platform, and they're all uh, GPL license or, or other, other explicit op open source licensing. Um, we have built that culture for years now with the maker movement of the free, you know, information wants to be free, designs want to be free, and, and there's more value in a community uh, in improving your product than there is in locking up the IP and, and keeping it in your closed garden. We say that all the time, but now we're actually seeing it uh, happen in the world and make something possible that would have been unthinkable if, if, if these, if, if every face shield had a patent on it, uh, we'd, we'd be right where we were two months ago. So, I mean, what, what what do you what 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 what's your been your experience with the open source movement in the past and how do you see that uh, you know as well, a tool I, going forward? What you just said is is so spot on and there is a, a further point to be extracted from from that is that without the maker community we would be much worse off. Um, lives have been saved because of the efforts of the maker community. It is because of the maker community and their open source designs and their willingness to share these designs that they were able to look at the situation and realize, okay, we're having a critical shortage in our, our, our supply chain was very vulnerable to begin with. And that's what, what kind of led to this. And the maker community were the people that said, let's do something. And they did, and they continue to. So I think that's a, a really important point to extract from what you just said, Keith, that that the maker community is, is saving lives and kind of steering the course of this pandemic in some ways, in terms of protecting people, in terms of the way patients are treated. I mean, do you think this changes the, the do you think this changes the IP landscape for medical gear going forward? I mean, are, is, people, are, are, is it gonna seem kind of, is it gonna seem kind of uncool to patent medical <laughs> devices? <laughs> going One of my biggest one of my biggest hopes for OSMS in the future is that people now will understand that a lot of medical items devices or supplies do not need to be so expensive they do not need to come from far away and they do not need to be so susceptible to this supply chain interruption and i i think that will be the case um that everyone is learning from this, that it's time to think about the way that this was done previously and how we're handling it now. Yeah, definitely, definitely modeling new ways of getting it done. Um, and I, th I think uh, staying uh, very connected to the makers who are in turn really connected to their community 
um, leads to a lot of innovations that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, even just within a design itself, um, there's a face shield uh, approved by the NIH, the DTM face shield, that was originally designed to have a buttonhole elastic. Well, that is very scarce right now. So someone uh, developed a 3D printed clip that you could use regular elastic with. Well, now regular elastic is difficult to source. So someone has developed a TPU flexible strap that is 3D printed for the DTM mask. So as scarcity materials develop, makers are right there to address that scarcity in any way they can. And all of those modifications are reflected in our documentation. Well, and on the idea of open source, um, I'm not an expert on, on open source and the IP, but its importance now is clearly highlighted. Uh, a couple days ago, a few of us at the Future Forge were working on a pulse oximeter project after hearing that there's anticipated need for pulse oximeters with rehabilitation. Um, and so we're looking into that and we're working on Linux, an open source operating system. We're using open source uh, program editors and uh, of the, uh, all the equipment that we're using is open source. The designs that we're using, um, they're in a a work in progress document that we have at OSMS for pulse oximeters. And these projects aren't all the way completed, but everything's been released as open source so far so that groups can collaborate and work on these designs. And it's just so many levels of things being open source that really makes it possible for somebody like myself and a place like the Future Forge to attempt to make pulse oximeters which is a incredibly complicated piece of technology requiring very specialized uh, equipment and codes. And those sort of things just would never be possible without all of these open source items layered together. And we very much want to see that continue to advance and people continue to release these open source designs and support open source movements in all areas. Um, that brings me to uh, my next question, which is what, uh, what's next? I mean, we talked about shields and masks and gowns and, and you know, things that um, are easier to make. You know, if you have a sewing machine or a serger, if you have a, a, a laser cutter or even without a laser cutter, you can make a, a lot of these basic PPE items, but, but um, you know, ventilators really are coming into their own now as a, a makeable product that is, that's been clinically tested. Uh, we've, we've seen Robert Reed's group, Public Invention, really do a good uh, ranking of sort of the progress of those designs as they approach um, manufacturability and, and the, the, the instructions are shared and, the, and they get some clinical testing. Um, that's a complex project. It's hardware and it's software and it's and it's a and it's the bigger supply chain problem, obviously. Um, but now you're talking about pulse oximeters. What what what's next? Uh, you know, for for um, makers at, at let's say let's say at a basic level at the, at the level of, of face shields and masks. But what's 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 next at the level of um, you know hardware, software, and you know maybe maker spaces that can collaborate on more uh -huh. more complex projects. Definitely. Uh, Ash is, is very correct about pulse oximeters um, because that has been recommended as an item to monitor yourself at home. So now everyone's like, I should have one of these to, to keep an eye on my oxygen levels. And if I see them dropping and I'm having other symptoms, I might be coming ill. Uh, so he's very right that uh, there's sometimes only pieces of an item available, like a component of it. So it's really going to be a lot of people coming together with the components. Um, more collaboration on that. And in terms of some of the more complicated designs that are coming up, and I know Ange and Victoria can speak for this one, but we're seeing things like the NIVs, which are the non-invasive ventilation helmets, the, the bubble helmet that everyone is, at, some most people are familiar with at this point, that looks very kind of retro space movie-esque uh, appearance. Um, but we are seeing designs like that that are, are much more complicated are 
starting to evolve, are starting to um, fall into a clinical role, even. So. And I mean, are you helping, you know, organize those collaborations, or are you just documenting what's what's going on out there? Are you, you you have a mixed mixed role in, in some of these new things. We really try to keep track of the conversations because everybody is kind of working on something on some level all over the world. Um, fabricators are going to make things that they can make now, uh, software and uh, more complex clinical uh, testing required products are going to take more time. So people are, have been working on those from day one, but the conversations have now just started to develop into documentation, prototypes. Now, some places in Europe are um, open sourcing um, NIV helmet designs. We're trying to keep track of their documentation. And we're working with clinicians and testing sites in the United States to uh, get progress in the United States for those because that's not a item that's really been used before in the United States, but it's more prevalent in Europe. So again, we try to make, uh, make um, uh, allowances for our international community, but also focus on the challenges for development here in the United States. Okay. And so and for people who don't know, and I don't, I don't really, but the NIV, the NIV bubble helmet idea, is that like, is that sort of an iron lung that's just on your head? Is that the idea? It's like positive, negative pressure, like create, creating a, a breathing. breathing Ash, could, could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So the, the NIV helmet um, helps get oxygen into uh, a patient's bloodstream um, through sustained increased positive pressure. Um, and uh, not to get too technical, but with the, uh, uh, the gas exchange in the lungs, having a positive pressure can help if there's reduced lung capacity. Um, and so it uh, combines well with increased oxygen concentration and can uh, keep a patient off a ventilator for longer. So one of the things that a lot of medical sites are looking at and a lot of people are interested in is with the limited ventilator, uh, intubation ventilators, um, you know, how do we maximize the use of those for patients that really need that high level of intervention? And with possible complications of using those, how can we keep patients on something that's a little bit less invasive? Yeah. Um, so that is not a breathe. That's not going to be a, a, a positive, negative breathing. It is not a negative pressure device. Right. It is strictly going to be a sustained positive to try and keep your oxygen levels up. Yeah. Um, it, it is a, a constant uh, higher than normal pressure level. And does that require... Is that required? We're interested in learning evidence? more. There's a great document about it that I highly recommend. <laughs> I would love to. Maybe somebody can drop it in the chat over here. Or, but uh, just curious, is that is that something that's uh, complex uh, from a feedback and, and sensing, you know, standpoint, or, or is it pretty much set it and forget it? How how difficult is control on that that um, NIV helmet? It's going to vary it, patient to patient. And also, uh, there, there is going to be quite a bit of feedback because the concentration of oxygen that a patient will need, their flow rate, uh, how much pressure they need to keep their lungs inflated, you will need some systems to monitor that. And again, uh, Ash is probably more well-versed on this than myself. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had to learn a lot in the background research here. And one of the things that goes into the documents is a lot of research into how we um, can look at these devices. And it kind of goes for the multiple audiences because we need to include some basic information that can help clinicians understand what makers might be doing to produce these so that they can talk to makers in an informed way and enough information for makers to be able to talk cl to clinicians to understand how these items are being used and what the requirements might be for an item. Um, this one was particularly difficult because it did not really exist 
before this. Um, it was used in, in some areas, but it wasn't something that was well documented. Um, and for a lot of that feedback stuff and how patients are monitored, um, some of that is simplified by these usually being hooked up to a pre-existing machine that either a, a ventilator or a CPAP that has a lot of those features built into it already. Um, but with that being said, um, that is getting outside of my area of expertise because I really just focused on the helmet part. When I did talk to clinicians, um, they, I was informed that a lot of those features are separate from the helmet itself. Okay. That's, um, that reminds me of Robert Reed's, Robert, Robert Reed's group, Public Invention is, is uh, they've, you know, been, they've kind of taken it upon themselves to um, track all the DIY ventilator designs, all, all the, all the ventilators designs around the world. And, and, you know, a lot of people are quickly prototyping something mechanical that will, that will create a, 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 a you know, breathing substitute. But uh, the control for that is, um, is the harder part of, of the project really. And, but it's also a project, it's also a part that's been well solved and could be made modular. And so they've designed it. It's basically, it's a testing rig that they're, they've designed for testing, I mean, I don't know, inlet pressure and PEEP, and I don't know all the, I don't know all the aspects of, but I mean, there's, there's how, how strong can, the, how strong can the patient exhale when, when their lung capacity is so limited and, and how much pressure can you give them without harming them? Those things all have to be sensed and, and monitored and, and fed back and adjusted constantly. That is an electronics project that's, that's basically already been solved. If you can make that modular, and affordable, then people could really improvise some of the mechanical uh, portions of that locally based on the materials and, and supply chains they have available to them. And, and the smart part of the project could be modular. So I, I wonder if, if you're seeing that in these NIV designs, is there, is there an effort to modularize it so that maybe the materials are more flexible and the supply chains are more flexible around the world? I think where we are with NIV documentation is uh, actually uh, tracking designs that are getting to clinical sites being tested and seeing of those designs how they are flexible to different uh, circuits. Um, when I'm talking circuits, I mean how oxygen is attached to the helmet itself it's because there are many different um, modifications for that. So in the, that's where the conversation is right now. Uh, there's not so much a concern about fabrication. The basics of fabrication are um, some 3D printing, perhaps, um, some injection molding if needed. Um, the plastic um, is a flexible plastic. Um, I'm not an expert on what is um, current for supply chains for NIV helmets. But I think, I think we're a little ways away from talking about supply chains for that because we need to, to get some designs actually working and on patients. Um, we should probably wrap up pretty quick. Is there anything else you uh, folks wanted to talk about or, or, or let, let this audience know about before we conclude? Just a thank you to all the bakers out there who are continually working to alleviate the shortages in this crisis. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think the makers need to realize that they are on the front lines. And um, what we do as a team is gather all the valuable information that they are establishing in the field, the conversations they're having, the documentation they're having. Um, because you can share something on Facebook with 70,000 people, but once that information is out there, someone needs to care enough about it to collect it and help it move along further so it can help others. Otherwise, you're just searching through Facebook for three months. So um, I think there's a lot of really positive intent in the maker community, intent to help, intent to make progress, to solve a problem. And we are here as a support to that community. 
Yeah, and, and you know, to that end, like, we are always looking for opportunities to connect. Um, you know, if you're working on a design, and especially if you are, you've already talked to clinicians, like, we want to connect with you. Um, and so stay active. Um, because as everyone else here has already said, we absolutely need you and we need you actively designing and connecting whenever possible. Well, we need you. I want to just say thank you to, to OSMS. And I mean, it's, it's been an enormous effort in a very short time and it's had real results. I mean, you have given makers the confidence that they can find a design that will help in their community and, and you've helped them under, understand how to connect with the, those medical communities um, but, you know, more, more importantly, to know that they can go home to their shop and make something that really will work and really will help save lives and really will make a difference. And that is, uh, that's certainty. It's very hard to come by right now. And, and just giving people the confidence that they are making a difference is, uh, is a beautiful thing. So thank you for, for all you're doing. And thanks for coming to Make a Fair.